Usually I would start my videos with some kind of skit or long-winded joke, adding a layer of tension, all leading to the conclusion where I would subvert a previously set expectation by saying something along the lines of, I hate this film and I wish I never saw it. But as uh, somewhat of a, a film lover, I believe that it is uh, kind of a duty to include at least one line devoid of my usual sarcasm. So I say this quite straightly, I hate this film and I wish I never saw it. You may be questioning right now, why am I talking about a movie that was released in 2016, which is now five years ago? And my answer to that would be, what else is like coming out right now? The Green Knight got delayed to June of this year and it's probably gonna get delayed again because why wouldn't it? I'm really excited to see it. Fuck me, I guess. So instead, I've been looking into the past and something I've never really paid that much attention to was The Thinning, which did make quite a buzz when it came out, mainly because people thought it was bad. So it was less of a buzz and more the low hum of a dying PT cruiser as it sinks into quicksand. And being the completely rational movie lover that I'm not, I thought what better time to judge it and see if the initial criticism was justified publicly in video format, of course, so I can make fun of it and uh, earn money. The answer to that question is surprisingly, not really. People were clearly a lot more critical of this film just because Logan Paul stars in it, which is a tad bit unfair to everyone else involved, like the director, Michael J. Gallagher, whose level of talent definitely exists somewhere. Something I should point out is that if you disliked this movie just because Logan Paul was in it, that's kind of really extremely stupid. Logan was not a creative force on this film. I'm not even sure if he got paid that much. The movie's budget was very low. It was only about a million estimated, which could be anything. And that's impressive that you could put a film together with just that amount of money. But on the other hand, a ghost story had a budget of $100,000 and that is a masterpiece also directed by the guy who's gonna make The Green Knight. That's called a wraparound. Go watch The Ghost Story, it's a brilliant film. So to dislike this entire movie just because of one person who was like kind of an actor who didn't get paid that much probably, it, it, does, it doesn't make any sense to me. If you, if you wanna do that, go watch Airplane Mode. That's a fucking horrendous movie that he was also like the director or writer for. It's just, that's what happens when you let him do ideas. Michael J. Gallagher, on the other hand, has directed episodes of The Real Bros of Simi Valley, which were great. Funny Story, which was like all right, and a 2012 movie that reinvented horror and introduced a new monster into the public mythos. Smiley. That movie was awful. I'm not even gonna, <laughs> it was so bad. I understand some people like enjoy this movie and they're wrong, but personal opinions can't be incorrect, and it's true. All five of this movie's fans are not wrong. It's their public, it's, it's their personal opinion. But they should be emphatically embarrassed. Speaking of emphatically embarrassed, do you want to be embarrassed in public, or why don't you subscribe to this channel and buy some of my merch? Or I'll kill you. <laughs> also, new merch. It was done by the same artist that did the uh, most recent design. Big fan of it. Instagram, here's the art station. Also link probably there of the actual merch so you can buy it. There you go. So where does the thinning fit into all of this? It's on the bad side. Yeah, when I said this film faced unjustly harsh criticism, I was being serious. It's just that when you look at it without the prejudice, it's also like just like a bad movie and I personally don't like it. And before those same five people come out to get mad at something and frothing at the mouth, it should be pointed out, um, liking a movie doesn't mean it's good and a film being good does not mean you are obligated to like it. Parasite is an excellent film and I like it, L like a lot. I have three copies of it. Taxi Driver is also a brilliant film. Saw it twice, I'm never gonna see it again. I just don't care. But Guy Ritchie's King Arthur, a significantly worse film, but I, I kind of like it. You know, I'll, I'll watch it here and there. Not all of it, because there were a horrible amount of reshoots, and, but I like it. You know, and there's, there's obviously the films that are bad and I don't like. So it's, it's like in the same way I have an amazing personality, but no one likes it. <laughs> I'm lying. Everything I say about myself in my videos is a complete fabrication. Stop asking if I'm okay. I am. It explains why the movie has a 60% on Rotten Tomatoes with over a thousand reviews, which is not nothing. 
meaning that theoretically, the general population thinks The Thinning is a better movie than 2019's Us, which is not a fair comparison, honestly, um, in terms of quality. The <laughs> Thinning is just so much better. Okay, so I've, I've established that I don't like the film, but I've also completely ignored uh, actually talking about it or describing it in any way, shape or form. That wasn't an oversight. I'm kind of scared, but you know, I have to do this eventually, so. Here we go. The year is the near future, by which they mean barely the near future, because it takes place in 2037, which we find out through a screen that is misspelled recorded. Usually when a movie says the near future, they mean like 50 to 100 years in the future, because that's what allows, I'll get into it later. The first issue with this movie could be an entire video by itself, and it probably is somewhere on YouTube. But this film needs to take place 200 years in the future, not 15. We need to believe that this system has been in place for a very long time, as well as uh, to be able to believe that society has completely shifted from, you know, don't murder kids to, listen here, Mr. Redding, if you want to be present, you got to kill those kids. Acceptable with 200 years, less so with like 15. It's also why learning about that complete cock up of the timeline that we are introduced to the premise of this movie, which is that overpopulation will or has, or is like currently threatening to ravage the world with something. And as a result, the UN has implemented a law, <laughs> question mark, doesn't really say, all the countries have to comply to it or something, where they cull the population by 5% each year, and the US specifically chooses a standardized test. In all seriousness, it is a decent premise, and many viewers have pointed to this as the movie's biggest plus, even using words like good. And I agree to a point, by which I mean it's kind of neat if you just don't think about it at all, and also don't watch the film. The idea of a country being forced to cull parts of its population and how it chooses to do so has potential to be an extremely interesting commentary on whatever you want. It's like stock standard dystopia. The possibilities are endless. You just have to have the imagination and vigor to pull it off. But this is a young adult dystopia, so f shut up. Look at you. One with themes and morals and science fiction dystopia. What an idiot! It's not like that's the whole point of a fictional Sophia. Even then, all of that completely hinders on whether or not the premise is... believable, if it could exist. In context, at least. Which, for me, it really isn't. I'm not trying to nitpick it like I'm CinemaSins or something, nor do I believe that pointing out inconsistencies of plot holes immediately makes a movie bad, regardless of context. I thought Godzilla vs. Kong was a pretty decent film, and that's a logic graveyard. But it's basically just pretending to be a movie so it can get to the parts that matter where the lizard punches the ape. The Thinning, on the other hand, has a lot of faults that create massive issues with the world building while also being like really easy to solve to the point where they were like accidentally introduced to the story. Why is it the UN that's heading this? Why not some fictional group formed in the future, similar to the UN, but including every country with a specific goal of solving overpopulation, monitoring population numbers and so on and so forth, just to show how, how big this issue is and how dire the situation is. Take the opening for Pacific Rim. Oh my God. The bad thing, people die, shit depressing, quote, the world came together, pooling its resources. Bam, in and out, simple. Seeing as the thinning doesn't show anything, it just opens with text. I do not understand the decision to not just copy that. Like you could just steal the opening from a different film and the movie would be better. Using the UN just makes everything like a lot more confusing than it really needs to be. This is not that smart of a movie, just Fucking make something up. The UN, by their own little text thing, it was formed to promote social progress, increase living standards, and uh, promote human rights. Specifically, they were made in this year, which should show you how weird it is that they are suddenly going to start mandating population culling. Using a power the UN, in our reality, doesn't really have, and doesn't like mention that there's at least, um, four somewhat important countries that aren't in the UN, one of them being the head of the Catholic Church, where all the Christians look to for their spiritual... Just make something up. There's also the tricky little issue that we don't even know if overpopulation will actually become a threat, at least not seriously for the next 50 years, 
let alone 15. It also does nothing to like imply that there's other problems that we are currently facing that will just magically disappear. What happened to the wealth gap? Everyone seems pretty fine. Crime. Crime was crime's a pretty big part of our lives right now. I think what ha what happened to it? Did all the criminals disappear? What happened to the concept of war? What's happening internationally? I'm not trying to nitpick, but like these questions are just like super obvious. Why would you not just make something up? It was good enough for Interstellar on the Blight to be good enough for this script. This massive ramble was just to point out that in spite of any good ideas this movie might have, almost everything about it is just like incredibly lazy. Did I mention the premise is like my favorite part? The film, you know, like where they're actually filming people and things actually starts with a short introduction to our leads, starting with Lena, who is shown to be smart, caring, driven, but ultimately struggles due to her uh, mother being too busy dying to help with the kids. Compare this to Blank, who gets less characterization, he's kind of portrayed as a slacker and a rebel, uh, but never underachieving like his girlfriend Ellie, who is afraid she won't pass the next thinning. A fear shared by one of the students Lena is tutoring, who ends up paying her for some black market contacts. Lenses, not like people. Um, they have the power to solve algebra and also uh, list out flight names, apparently, using a processor that's small enough to be invisible and also create literally no heat. It's either that or hyper-advanced cloud computing or like nanomachines, any of which would indicate science and technology has um, you know, progressed far enough in this near future to be well beyond the point of being able to, you know, start combating overpopulation. So again, this script really needs some kind of like overbearing threat. So I stop asking all of these fucking questions. <laughs> Maybe it pairs to and uses the processing power of their phones. Maybe I'm wrong, but they use Blackberries, so I'm not. Blake's portion of the intro mainly focuses on, as said before, his girlfriend, who he sneaks out of the house to meet. But his father's the governor, and his security detail uh, catches them. Because Blake is a moron. It's very played out, cliche, we all know that. But it does introduce the conflicting ideas between the two, you know, father and son. But it also tries to have like a cute little moment where he offers Blake a Pop-Tart, like in a special box. And it's really weird because it's treated like an extremely rare thing that he has only a few of because he's in a position of power. Were this the critically acclaimed universes of Mad Max or Waterworld, uh, this would make sense. If the food was caviar or saffron or something, it would make it would make more sense in this universe. But Pop-Tarts are like 90% wheat and sugar. Do you know how much food America makes? It's insane. <laughs> Literally the best explanation we receive is before the small children take a test later on in the film, as they're showing a cutesy, somewhat misleading propaganda film uh, that explains what thinning is. And it would be a lot more effective if the audience knew the gravity of the, the the gritty truth. But we don't get any specifics, we have no idea what's going on, and I'm just scared. The most information we actually get from this film is vague statements like, First she got too hot. And the water was rising, which sounds like global warming, but it also talks about physical space, which is n not global warming. It's like a different thing. Either way, those two things could probably be solved by advancements in science, this movie does more to prove exists than it doesn't. I just really... I just love this film. After that charming little talk, we move on to the actual thinning. The second last one Blake has to complete, which is actually somewhat important. But shocker! Ellie and the Tudor Kid fail the test. I was so attached. Ellie, because this movie's dumb, and the Tudor Kid, because he's dumb. Also, the cheat contacts got knocked out of his eyes from the weakest shoulder bump I have ever seen. I have received high fives with more force than that, which indicates the script was either changed a lot more times than it was proofread, or no one really cares, because it seems that these were meant to be glasses that knocked, oh no, my glasses have fallen off. Someone steps on them, smush, glasses gone but they were changed to high high tech contact lenses and like no one just thought that doesn't make any sense. Generally though, I'm fine with this first act. It sets up the world, its details and its rules all so it can specifically break or ignore all of them later, but it gives us a chance to see some character traits, latch onto and see our direct motivations for one of the two main characters, which is more than some movies do. It's not entirely believable either, 
but the director is using film language to tell me this stuff, so I'm just gonna let that slide. The story, as all good stories do, jumps ahead one year. Blake's relationship with his father is strained because he refused to bend the rules for Blake's girlfriend, and Lane's relationship with her mother is also strained because she is dead. Blake intends to mail a SD card or something with a video explaining his intentions to get himself killed because of how much he despises the system of the thinning. Which is strange, given he was seemingly completely fine with the previous 10-ish times he was doing it, but also because, spoilers, the twist of this movie is that uh, sometimes a chosen few of the failed students are used for slave labor for the Ashura Global Company that's super important in this universe. He ends up there anyway because of his father's orders, so why not start with that? The decision to swap his failure state with another student and not immediately try and contain him so he doesn't squeal seems to be a really massive oversight that would be understandable if his father wasn't given the video explaining what he is going to do by a tale that was about as subtle as a garbage truck. Oh no, my son has failed. Quick, head security man, swap his grades with someone else. This makes sense. The governor thinks his son is trying to pass and therefore if he does pass, he'll never know because the students don't really know their grades. But Blake was secretly trying to fail, so he knows something's up, which then acts as a catalyst for the second half of the film. But the governor knows he's trying to fail and tell the world about it. Why would you not expect him to just do the things that happen afterwards? Or just, just start screaming stuff like, I failed the test on purpose. The governor is corrupting the system. He's not gonna stay silent out of fear. He tried to get himself killed, like on purpose. What are you doing? <laughs> this massive bleeding plot hole only exists because for some reason, someone on the production wanted the, to have a scene of Blake's video being watched by his father uh, and intercut with footage of the test and all of that, with, with dramatic music. The entire plot could be made like 10 times better by just taking this one scene, and just moving it like five minutes in the future. It plays out basically the same. I don't even think you would need to reshoot it. The results seem to be recorded in real time. So you could just have a scene of, um, you know, like, Mr. Sir, your son is like failing and stuff. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure he passes, sir. He passes the test, Blake knows something wrong because he answered D for everything. And he goes to investigate. He slips through their grasp. Sir, we found a package. Oh my God, watch this video. Where's my son? He's disappeared. Oh, he's going to expose the things. Chair, voila, problem solved. But no, the whole thing's a confusing mess. Lena fails, Blake runs off to do stuff because there's no security for some reason. His father seems to have forgotten what the fuck is actually happening. It doesn't even try to solve anything. I mean, I usually say to myself, at least it makes the rest of the movie happen. But I've literally just shown a solution which requires very minimal changes and would still allow everything else to happen exactly the way it does. Either way, this teacher who is shown to have a good relationship with Lena, that's called setup, clearly understands that she is uh, way too smart to fail and gives her a keycard thing to hopefully escape or something. It's a bit optimistic, but whatever. Blake starts to fuck around with some wires and somehow shuts the entire school down. It's not how wires work, but I'll let it slide. There's already too many problems in this film. I can't be here all day. You know, Lena, she, she escapes just before she's injected, runs into Blake and then they escape into these oddly large air vents. There's like 14 things in that collection of events that is just confusing or stupid, but I really want to talk to like about something other than the plot because I feel like I'm nitpicking. I'm not, but it feels like it. Like sending the school into lockdown allows me to bring up the cinematography and by golly, this movie looks like complete shit. It's so ugly. Just when you thought I was gonna be nice, pull a twist on you. The film seems to be going uh, for a dark, somewhat depressing tone with, you know, I understand, I understand that. Subject matter of this movie, desaturated colors, high contrast. I get that. But even considering that, the film is just dark to the point where without modifying it, I couldn't actually watch it because I didn't, I didn't know what was happening. I tried it on different players, different monitors, different computers, my phone and my TV. The film itself is just graded extremely dark. When our main characters first meet, they're standing in like complete darkness with periodic flashes of light to illuminate their faces. 
But even with the flashes of light, it's so dark, you can't see anything they're doing. The cinematographer for this film, and many other Michael J. Gallagher classics, is a man called Greg Carlton. And although they commonly work together, he has had uh, a few films that he's worked on that they haven't. Specifically, for this video, two features and one short. Stray is a feature film, notably starring uh, Karen Fukuhara, released in 2019, quite recent, not to be confused with Stray, released in 2018, or The Stray, released in 2017, or A Stray, released in 2016, or Stray, released in 2020. It's really quite simple, Stray. I won't go into the premise or the plot because, like, it's just not the point of this video, but, um, to me, it, this represents what Greg wants his films to look like. And I can see the similarities between the two films, with Stray just being noticeably more complex, more layered, there's more thought, more time put into it. It is flashy and grandiose at times, which is a bit much, but he clearly understands how light works. Like, he's not bad at his job. The short film he worked on, Spectrophobia, which you can watch for free, also echoes this, uh, although it's much lower budget. Uh, it's still very clear how Greg wants the shot to look, we, even with the limitations of the budget and literally how much space there actually is in the apartment. I still think this looks way better than any shot in the fitting. Uh, the last film I want to bring up is Straight Up, which is nothing like the previous films. Um, there is no dark moody lining or fancy setups. It was only shot in like two, three weeks or something like that. And most of the film revolves around conversations of just like two to three characters. Again, I can't explain the premise, even if I wanted to, it's just so weird. But the entire film is quite bright, and it looks good. The film itself is also excellent, you can buy it on DVD, but you can also watch it on American Netflix. It's, it's a wonderful film to watch, and it looks good. It's very clear that he's not just like a one-note cinematographer, like he knows what he's doing. They, they, the films look okay, like, alright? That's what I'm saying. So why the fuck does this film look so bad? I don't know, maybe someone, like, he graded it all and he set it all up and did all the things and then someone came along later and just dropped the blacks to the floor or, like, upped the contrast too much or there was, like, onerous time constraints. Maybe it has something to do with SDR content and it, they just sent that and it was just crushed through YouTube's compression. Honestly, I have no idea, but I fucking hate it <laughs> so much. Unfortunately, uh, while I've been talking about something interesting that I enjoy, the movie's still been going on and I have to continue talking about it. We've reached a heart-to-heart uh, -heart slash flirty slash revelation slash meet cute slash bad scene where Blake takes a jab at how uh, Lena sells answers to the test or something, except it's been established he doesn't actually know her or remember her name. So this scene feels like it should happen a bit my main critique of this scene happens later, so... <sighs> oh my god, that never happened. Wait, what scene? The main takeaway from this part of the film is uh, the setup of a few different side plots, which seemed to be too strong a word. Things that are happening. Uh, Governor Redding gets blindsided by a question about the school still being in lockdown, showing media coverage is ramping up, some of the students are starting to get frustrated, they're still in lockdown, and oh no, since this teacher gave her Thing. To Lena, she no longer has it and will be immediately suspected if they check her. These things are not important, like at all, but it's it's something that a f the story is supposed to have in a film. And in the context of the other forms of media, media I have discussed on this channel, it's like a massive step up to the streets. That's the second time in two videos I've referenced that movie, which really makes you question if it's my favorite movie of all time. It's not. I'm just insane. Back to Blake and Lena. What characters? Um, or should I say back to Lena because Blake falls through the vent and into the pool. How convenient! Less convenient is the fact he somehow knocks himself completely unconscious from hitting the water in what appears to be a completely normal way. I'm not a water scientist, so I'll just pretend that I understand that and it makes sense. I don't, and I don't think it does, but you know, Lena saves Blake, which means that this movie has to keep going, and it's during this scene that I remembered Logan's not, not like a great actor. The situation is made quite a bit worse by the uh, stunning lack of chemistry between the two of them. It is surprising at times 
how disconnected these two are. At this point, Blake has a more interesting dynamic with the fucking water he almost drowned in than he does with the main character. Our little gremlins scamper back up into the vents, but uh, Lena drops the NFC chip somehow out of her pocket that's dangled. Fuck it. So they have to go into the science room and build a thing to get it back, I guess. She has to go back up there into the vent and uh, a guard checks the room for a reason that I don't think actually exists, which makes sense in context because this guard only does things that makes no sense. Like standing over Blake for several seconds, waiting for him to turn around just so we can go, Like, why was he standing there? I don't get it. <laughs> I can't think of a single reason for that, except those things happen in movies, and this definitely is one. Don't look this up. The same thing happens like a minute later. When Lane is picking up the thing, Blake's being knocked out. Oh no, actually, Blake knocked the guy out and swapped the uniforms. Why would he like grab the chip? If he knew the plan, fuck no, scratch that. He was there when they were building the plan. <laughs> it's just an attempt to implement some kind of tension, even though it makes no sense. Like just have the chip drop. Oh no, the guard sees it. I'm caught. The guard hooks it back on. Oh, what? Blake? Is that you? F see, it would be the same scene. Except now there's not a giant neon sign that just has the writing. I think you're a fucking moron, audience. But it is after that eye-opening experience that we get one scene I actually kind of like, but only with several exceptions, and specifically in the context of this movie. We come back to the teacher that helped Lena, and uh, in her previous scene, she was almost caught missing her chip. So she flirts with a different teacher in order to swipe his chip, which I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt to the film and say that this was this was set up in a previous scene. Um, the teacher is uh, kind of flirting with a student, showing that he's a he's a bad dude, and it cuts to nice teacher, showing us that she saw that yeah? with her eyes as a human. The big exception for this scene is that the setup isn't exactly subtle um, because it happens twice. In fact, after the time skip, the first character we're introduced to is this unnamed student who's clearly struggling with <laughs> Ooh, did you catch that film language? I think that was a bit too subtle. <laughs> she trades certain favors um, to get a passing grade, which she doesn't actually get. Good teacher spots the girl leaving his car. All right, that's a setup. In fact, the first time works a little better, in my opinion, because it also introduces that the system could be open to some kind of corruption by basically anyone. <laughs> F fuck it, do the scene again. It's like it expects the audience to be drifting in and out of reality at this point, because, you know, the movie's just so exhilarating, I can't stop paying attention. But I like that scene, all right? It's a neat little scene that lasts 40 seconds. So rounding up to the nearest whole number, I've enjoyed 1% of this film, completely unironically. Which sounds bad, but it is 1% more than I enjoyed Stuba, a film I forgot while I was watching it, Lena has made her way into the server room and gets Kellen's help to log in. I'm going to talk about Kellen in this whole scene a lot more later, so I'm just going to be brief. But she finds that she received a 98%, but football guy got a 45 but passed. And Blake got a 15% and somehow still passed. Lena snaps some hot picks with an axe and sends them to Kellen. She gets caught. Blake gets caught trying to free the other students, who I assume have just been sitting there bored out of their fucking minds in this, like, little freezer section for three hours, which is hilarious to me. But as they're about to be thinned out, Kellen sends the pics with an X to the news. Uh, the story breaks, get to you in a minute. Governor Redding's hand is forced and he switches all of the Mac. Lena is free, uh, kisses Blake, finally cementing their shared delusion called love, built on the previously shown raw chemical reactions I have not seen since I poured a bucket of water into a tub of slightly more water. Oh my God. Oh, it's so thrilling. Bang, ugh, they're secretly not dead. See points previous. This kind of ruins the whole plot of the movie by itself, if it wasn't already ruined by the plot of the movie. Now, most of what I was doing was just laying out the movie as things literally happen, like step for step, pointing out notable flaws or interesting things. But the largest overarching problem with the film, I didn't mention it before, but only as it applied to that instance. And the problem is, is nothing makes any sense 
or is like remotely consistent. All right, let's tackle this from the start because this video isn't long enough and I'm not losing my voice. Um, the hook, the premise, the thinning, what is it as an idea? It's, it's obviously a test. What does it do? What does it mean? How does it affect the world? Specifically the world of our characters, specifically the people I'm actually supposed to care about. How does the public react to it? How do they respond? Do people disagree with it? Are there any other proposed solutions? Do they believe it works? Do they have faith in the system? Do they even understand how it works? Is there levels of oversight? Is there transparency? Do they suspect corruption or do they just pretend not to see it? Uh, and the answer to everything I just listed is... Uh-huh, sure. Because it completely depends on what scene you're currently watching. The school is either a completely normal building with uh, facilities like lockers, a science lab, a pool, and a completely normal football field, but other times it's a fenced off prison surrounded by a desert, with server rooms, guards, with deep voice changes, but not all of them have it. Some of the restraints shorted during the power outage. I was just told to move these students to the recreation hall immediately. And a rusty death dungeon somewhere in the school's halls. You know, with dystopian grey architecture really cementing the whole thing. Students act and respond like they are in a dystopia. They're sullen, looking down, loitering in the hallway, chatting with people, frozen in fear. If someone you know your entire life is gonna be dragged away, killed, and then five minutes later, partying. The corruption of the thinning is either an open secret that everyone knows or a revolutionary new discovery. And also the outside of the school looks like a hellscape with um, masked guards that are introduced by beating the shit out of a kid that tried to run and you know somehow the entire system crumbles after it's leaked that the guards also beat this the shit out of some of the students that passed like yeah dude they're in charge of murdering kids the biggest fuck up from all of this and would single-handedly ruin a perfect film is the fact that lena is the person blake's grades are swapped with presumably but why not swap the grades themselves so this could just never happen? This whole thing came crumbling down because Lena's teacher knows that she is incredibly smart and her failing is basically impossible. I'm Lena's teacher. Lena's the best student I've ever had. I am finding it very difficult to believe that she failed the exam. She's tutoring kids that are passing. These students clearly talk and know each other. Kellen even states that it's it's strange that Blake doesn't know her name because the year levels shrink each year. Not to mention the shared trauma of watching students you know in each year level die. Trauma that disappears depending on the scene. There is an extremely high chance these students would know not how smart each person is, but the smartest people, especially because she's fucking tutoring kids. And people reference that. They know! <laughs> there is no way that people wouldn't be immediately suspicious that she failed, but this fucker didn't. Which would be acceptable if it was established that corruption was an open secret and no one wanted to stand up in case they would replace her. But it was also established the exact opposite was happening so fuck. Like, why Lena? You know, if you really wanted the character to be a genius or something, just throw in a line like, Oh, late again, ha, Lena. I know you need money for your mother and to take care of the kids, but maybe come back on the tutoring. Even geniuses need to study sometimes, hence establishing high intellect but allowing for a low enough score to have this make any fucking sense. Then I watch a different movie. Governor Redding never specifies who to swap like scores with. He just asks some king, I don't know his name, to fix it. And this is the solution he comes up with? They swapped the football man's fail with someone else and that didn't seem to fuck everything up. I haven't even mentioned that Ellie didn't actually fail. She got an 88%, but presumably Governor Redding swapped her with someone because he didn't like his son being distracted. Is there something in the air that just makes everyone really stupid? So it like kind of works for the audience because it's stated that she thinks she's going to fail. Like, yeah. More of that, please! <laughs> You've already done it. In the film, I'm watching it. It wasn't even particularly fun to sift through the movie and like get down to the brass tacks of why I have issues with this film because sift is doing a lot of overtime with that sentence. 
because it means to examine something thoroughly. I wasn't even examining it passively. The flaws were just like thrown at me. They were so obvious. Most of them I caught in the first viewing. I felt like I was expecting, if not a somewhat competent film, uh, at the very least, a fun little Easter egg hunt to find the misstep, where, uh, the points where they make mistakes. You know, which points to this, which points to that. And I go behind the scenes and get more info. It wasn't any of that. It was, it was like I was handed a plastic bag filled with broken eggs. Like, wow, what a fun hunt. Um, thank you for watching. Uh, sorry the video took a bit longer than usual, as you could probably might be able to tell. I'm still a bit sick, so, but I can't wait any longer. I'm just gonna do this now. Get it over and done with. Um, name of the fellows who are supporting me through YouTube's membership thing, thanks to them. Um, scrolling by. Buy my merch, if you want it. I really appreciate it, it's a great way to support me. Um, or just subscribe, like the video if you enjoyed it. I might do the second film, I have seen it, and I, it's probably, I think it's actually worse, which is weird. But I was gonna do it in this video, but now this one's, I've been recording for like an hour and seven minutes. So it's probably good that I didn't do this one <laughs> in the same video. I would be here for 10 years. Um, thank you for watching, uh, I'll see you next time, goodbye.